everyone, I'm Kirby. This is Kirby Meets Audio, and today we're gonna talk about the enclosures for our studio monitor build. We started this project about a month ago, and the original concept was some kind of quick and easy studio monitors, bedroom studio monitors, slash desk music listening computer speakers. Although I wanted this to just be a quick, like three video series, it's quickly snowballed into, I think this is the third or fourth video, and we've got at least two more, and maybe three more. I've been having fun, too much fun, and I've just put more effort into it than I thought I was going to. And as you're about to see, this quick, easy, and small monitor build has turned into, uh, they're big, and they're gonna be heavy. All right, let's just jump into the design on the computer. All right, so I've been designing this enclosure in Fusion 360. If you design anything physical and end up making it in the future and you're not using some sort of CAD design software, you should check out something. Awesome to make multiple failures very rapidly. <laughs> Fail in the computer rather than like in real life with product. Okay, so this enclosure behemoth is 20 inches by 20 inches. It's a it's a big, big, it's a big dude, big dude. And some of the astute of you out there might be wondering why it's 20 by 20. What about standing waves, Kirby? There's gonna be, it's, you can't have the width equal to the depth, that's standing waves. So these speakers are gonna start out with a passive crossover network being driven by an external amp. But we had so much excitement in the comment section about true in-studio monitor, specifically made for studio recording monitors build. People wanted a real studio monitor build, not some bedroom bullshit. So these speakers are gonna start with a passive crossover, but there's room in here to upgrade to a triamped active DSP crossover network. So if we take off the lid here, you can see in the back, we have this false back. So the actual dimensions are not 20 by 20, they're actually 20 by 16 and a half. The back has this opening that we can put the passive crossover in now, and then later on we can take that out and put in our amps and our DSP modules and whatever else we want to do to these speakers later on. Building a platform for some experimentation and design in the future. All right, let's talk some details. So this is a base reflex enclosure, which means it's ported, it's not sealed. The enclosure is tuned to 37 hertz with the driver's F3 at 39 hertz. Uh, we're going for two ports both at two inches in diameter, just over seven and a half inches long. We have a total internal volume of 1.5 cubic feet. Pretty, pretty big, they're big boys. A commenter in the original video in this series suggested that I use a PVC pipe for the mid enclosure. I, I had never done this before. I've seen other people do it, but it's a great idea. So I thought, well, let's use it in this project. So the mid enclosure is this four inch by six inch ABS plastic it will have a back in the uh, final. I just didn't model the back yet. It is a pretty big area for the enclosure. So there's a lot, pretty substantial amount of bracing involved in here. We have this kind of double cross brace. Uh, there's a little notch cut out for the mid enclosure pipe. As far as the ports, we have two ports. They're two inches in diameter and just over seven and a half inches long. I've done this in previous projects. I get these ports that have a back flange. They're screwed into the back of the front baffle and then I use a roundover bit on the inside of the porthole to make this flare on the front using the solid wood front baffle. Makes for kind of a cool, cool look. For the front baffle, we have our eight inch reference series woofer, our four inch, it's actually a three inch reference series mid, and then our AMT tweeter. The tweeter and the mid are stacked, and that's kind of the meat and potatoes before we get into details. All right, so let's talk about diffraction. Uh, let me get a enclosure that I can just like. So as diffraction happens in speaker design, when uh, a sound wave that is coming from your source, from your driver, uh, radiates out in a spherical fashion from the source and hits an obstacle. In this case, it's the edge of the baffle. And that obstacle being the drop in pressure from half space, which would be 
everything in front of the baffle to full space, which is the front baffle backwards. That pressure difference creates additional sound waves that are gonna have phase effects on your original source. Those phase problems that are introduced are going to either diminish or reinforce certain frequencies depending on the distance from the source to the obstacle, which is going to overall create ripples in your speaker's frequency response. Edge diffraction impacts frequencies differently depending on the frequency's wavelength. So higher frequencies have shorter wavelengths, which means they come into contact with edge diffraction much quicker than lower frequencies, which have longer wavelengths. But that brings us into baffle step. All right, just a little interlude here. Uh, this is all super quick and dirty explanations. I have decided that I wanna do a series of in-depth um, theoretical discussions on design theory and all this fun stuff. But this is just to get you an idea of why I did certain things on this enclosure build. But let's talk about baffle step. So most lower frequencies aren't really affected by edge diffraction because the lower frequencies wavelengths are too long. They, uh, they just flow right through uh, the edges and it's not impacted in the same way as high frequencies are. That seems awesome, right? So we don't have to worry about edge diffraction with lower frequencies as well. One benefit of short frequencies is that they can radiate in half space, uh, the space in front of the baffle, and be amplified because of it. Since we don't have that amplification in lower frequencies because the sound waves are so long, they just go right through the baffle, we get a full space in the lower frequencies while we're having half space in the higher frequencies. That is baffle step, basically. You can kind of think of it as the tweeter in mid, kind of halfway in the mids, in some cases, has an extra amplifier, which is the baffle, that's able to increase the perceivable amplitude of the music while the bass driver, the woofer, uh, doesn't have that same extra amplification. All the sound waves coming from the woofer are all going out in all directions at the same time, right? They're hitting the back wall, they're coming at you at your face. The tweeter is basically until those sound waves hit the edge of the baffle are only coming to your face. They're not going backwards. So that, that extra little boost that the high frequencies get from the front baffle usually gives it a, um, well, we shouldn't say that. It usually, so the, the <laughs> the lower frequency is not having that reinforcement from the baffle usually gives it a 6 dB or half uh, amplitude decrease in perceivable volume. I honestly don't know if I'm making this any easier to understand. <laughs> but basically, unless you have an infinite ba baffle setup with your speakers, in your room, whatever speakers you are designing, creating for your space, anything below 400 to 500 hertz is going to be perceivably lower in amplitude volume compared to the high. So their speakers are gonna sound brighter than they should. It's not gonna be a flat frequency graph if that's what you're looking for. And in our case, we are, because we're building studio monitors. So what can you do about all this? Well, starting with edge diffraction, one really easy thing you can do is to chamfer the edges. So like, th this is a bad example, but in this port tube here, it's there's a rounded edge. If you rounded all of these edges, you wouldn't have such a fast pressure drop from the front of the baffle to the side of the baffle, and that would ease your edge diffraction. It wouldn't be as ripply <laughs> in your measured response as a just 90 degree edge. And that's to say, if you do wanna keep a rectangle-ish enclosure, obviously a sphere doesn't have edges like, um, a rectangle does or a square does. So a sphere would be your best bet for uh, uh, edge diffraction list design. But most people are gonna make rectangle speakers. Uh, so beveled edges, chamfered edges, rounded edges, those are your best bet. The second thing you can do for edge diffraction, get this back, I don't know why I keep putting it away, we're gonna keep using it, is to not have equal 
distances from your source to your edges. So in this case, let's say this was a tweeter. Well, it is a full range. So in this case, these two edges are the same distance from the source driver. So whatever frequency is affected by this distance from the cone to the uh, edge is going to be either doubly <laughs> amplified or doubly uh, reduced because there's two. Now this edge is slightly longer than these two edges. So this edge is going to have a slightly different frequency affected by the, the edge diffraction. Same goes for all, all of these. But if you had three, so two points is bad. You shouldn't have, you shouldn't have. Um, uh, if you want to decrease the amount of ripple you're gonna get in your frequency response from your speaker, um, offsetting your drivers, especially the tweeters and anything above 400, 500 hertz is going to lower your chances for, it's gonna smooth out the ripples in the top end of your frequency graph. Oh boy. <clears throat> All right, so that's edge diffraction kind of. Um, now what you can do about baffle step is you can either make a, a baffle step correction circuit which lowers all the frequencies above 400, 500 hertz um, to uh, uh, lowers it about 6 dB, which is the typical baffle step. Or you can increase your, you know, lower frequencies in the same manner, up 6 dB, which is what I've done in my design. Preliminary design. I, everything I'm doing right now is just theoretical to talk about it with you guys to kind of give you an insight on what I'm doing in this project. Um, most of the actual design work of the crossover and corrections to the inevitable flaws in my design is gonna happen after I build the enclosure and do the measurements myself in the space, outside, all that stuff, you'll, you'll, you'll see it then. All right, let's go back to the computer and, and the design we're working on. So this front baffle, as you can see, this tweeter, here, let's get rid of, one bummer about Fusion, putting, I have these like, I think they're called decals. Actually, they're not even decals, they're canvases. I put these canvases on these bodies to represent obviously the different drivers, but they put these red boxes around and I don't know how to get rid of those red boxes. If anyone knows, please comment. I would love to, to know as well. These are our drivers. I'm gonna put the sketches back on. All right, so woofer. Midwoofer tweeter. Okay. Edge diffraction impacts our higher frequencies the most. So we're mostly worried about the tweeter. So we have the tweeter obviously offset from right to left. It's more to the right than the left. We have it offset from top to bottom. It's more on the top than the bottom. The only other thing is to check this offset from the center point to the top and the center point to the right. So we got just over three inches to the top and three and a half inches to the side. So Pretty close, but but enough of a difference that it's not gonna accumulate um, problems down the line. Same with the woofer. So we got, or the midwoofer, uh, just under three and a half inches. Ooh, just over three and a half inches. So again, close. That's the other thing. I, I think there's like a 20%. You wanna be outside of 20%. There's some like rule that I, I probably should be following that I'm not, but whatever. So that's that. Another thing to keep in mind, which I don't know if I should be bringing this up, but is lobing. Everyone, everyone ready to talk about frequency lobing? Speaker lobing? All right, again, this is just a quick and dirty explanation of, of lobing, of, of all this stuff. More in-depth videos to come. Seriously, there'll be, I'll put a, more effort into those. <laughs> Trust me. All right, polar plots. If we take a look at VitUX CAD uh, down here in the bottom left, or I guess bottom center, we have a good example of a polar plot. Polar plots basically reveal um, acoustic radiation into space. So in this graph, our speaker would be at the center here facing forward, facing zero degrees. This is space in front of the speaker. This is space in back of the speaker. This would be 60 degrees off center from the speaker, 30 degrees, you get it. As we go through, the different frequencies, this particular polar plot is showing us amplitude within space. 
according to our crossover in this program with the FRD, the plots that we inputted, input, input that we put in <laughs> at the beginning, it's giving us an example of the lobing that we can expect based on those inputs. So at 739 hertz, uh, we're going to see a slight increase in acoustical pressure or volume amplitude at 40 degrees. Then we are at center, which is only going to be about 86 dB. Um, if we keep going up, we're going to see even more lobing. So now we got higher pressure in the center and a little bit lower pressure at 30 degrees. I, I'm just using this graph as an example. This isn't a perfect analogy, but as we go up in frequencies, lobing becomes more pronounced. So you can see as we're getting higher and higher in frequencies, I mean, this is like way above what we can even hear, but you can see the, the lobe gets smaller and smaller. So horizontal directivity um, or beaming um, is in direct relation to the driver's size. A larger speaker is going to start lobing, lobing at or beaming at a uh, lower frequency than a smaller speaker, which is, you know, okay because we're using, we're normally using larger speakers for lower frequencies and smaller speakers for higher frequencies. Lobing also happens in vertical orientation. So if you're in the sweet spot of a speaker, you're sitting in front of it and it sounds great, you might stand up or move up a few inches and you might hear a dip in certain frequencies. And then as you get a little higher, it comes back and maybe other frequencies dip. Lobing happens in vertical orientation as well. There are some differences in vertical lobing uh, when it comes to different crossovers. So a third crossover orders, third order crossover has a, a different effect on lobing than a second order crossover. Second order crossover, like what we're using in our projects, has a pretty symmetrical lobe right at the listening position at the zero axis, whereas a third order crossover it usually has a 10 degree or so dip in that lobing beaming center point but we don't have to worry about that in this project so this is one reason why a lot of people like to introduce mtm style speakers uh mtm style speaker is a midwoofer tweeter midwoofer i'll put a picture up the orientation of these speakers makes it so you get a pretty uniformed symmetric lobing pattern or you basically you don't get any lobing. You get you get a pretty symmetric uh, in space radiation of the frequencies, um, no matter where you're standing or sitting. <laughs> I feel like I'm going a little crazy. All right. So one way to keep lobing at bay is to keep speakers especially the higher frequency speakers as close together as possible. That's why you see a lot of two way designs have the midwoofer overlapping the tweeter just a little bit. And you can actually calculate out how close those drivers should be. And we can do that with our design. It, it all depends on the crossover point. So the crossover point between our uh, tweeter and our midwoofer is at around 3,500 Hertz. It's moving around a little bit depending on the day <laughs> I'm having with the crossover design. We can take the wavelength of 3,500 Hertz, use that as a guide for how close we need uh, our drivers to be. So the wavelength of 3,500 Hertz is 3.7 inches. So we want the center points of our tweeter and our midwoofer to be within 3.7 inches. So let's check that right now. And it's just within. Distances between our tweeter and midwoofer is 3.6 inches. So we're good. And then if you wanted to do the same thing for our uh, woofer to our uh, midwoofer, our crossover frequency there is just around 300 hertz, which is has a wavelength of 58 inches. So as long as our woofer and midwoofer is within 58 inches, uh, we should be fine. Whole enclosure is only 20 inches wide, so it's it can't be more than 58. Um, yeah, and we're at just about seven inches from center to center, so all good there. The reason why I'm going into this with this design is because although in my use case, lobing isn't a huge issue as long as it's on center axis because it's really just 
me who's gonna be listening to the speakers. I'm just gonna be sitting in my listening position with the speakers pointed right at me, so I'll always be in the sweet spot. But for most studio monitors, although in most mixing sessions, it's usually just one person or a few people, uh, in a recording session, it might be a bunch of people. There might be a producer there, uh, the actual recording artist, you know, other people in the room. So you want a good dispersion of sound, an even dispersion of sound from the monitors. Um, so this is definitely something to keep in mind if you're planning on designing your own studio monitors, even if they're just for yourself or the best, or any speaker. This this is also, so if you're, if you're also building or thinking about building home theater speakers, that's why a lot of home theater speakers use MTM uh, orientation drivers because not everyone is crammed into the sweet spot <laughs> in on the couch. There's usually people spread out in the living room or whatever you're listening. Uh, or viewing situation is. So good dispersion in home theater is also good. So keep in mind that stuff. Okay, I, I think that's, that's might be it. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know about this video. Like I said, I, I these topics are interesting and it's a little bit deeper than I normally go in my videos. This is like, 102 or something like it's it's not quite deep in the weeds but it's it's deeper than just like using some software to throw together some speakers so i do want to get into this type of stuff in more in-depth videos more focused videos that i'll put out in the future so stay tuned for that otherwise i hope you got something out of this i'm really enjoying the discussions we're having in the comment sections it's really cool hearing from people within the industry who have feedback on uh, my designs and how i'm going about the design process this is slightly different for me than my typical hi-fi speaker designing just a different lane but it, i enjoy it it's fun and i please keep the discussions going comment um i you know the favorite color, blue. Blue is, was like a big favorite color. Everyone likes blue, apparently. Comment your favorite color, color down below. Also, oh, I have a big ask for you guys. If you're still watching, you guys are the reals. Who are your favorite YouTube producers, uh, recording engineers, anyone who uses, who's your favorite YouTuber that you think would, would like uh, studio monitors? My studio monitors in particular. Comment your favorites down below, tag them even, and I don't know, maybe we can figure out a collab situation. All right, I, memberships are open. I think there's like three people in this very tight-knit club. <laughs> go, go join, there's a join button down below. Uh, it's like five bucks a month and uh, you get some extra content. You get direct interaction with me. I answer you guys' questions and I'll do some design work for you. I also am going to, this whole project, I, I'm being so methodical about it because I'm going to be putting them up as, putting this, this project up as plans. And the first people that are gonna have access to those plans are my members. And they're also gonna get a discount on purchasing them. So uh, yeah, join if you want to help out with this channel. <laughs> Hope you guys got something out of this. I'll, oh, this is the last video before the actual build video. So the next video you see in this series will be the actual build video. I think I've been saying that almost every video up to this point, but that's it. This is it. No more prep. We're actually going to build this guy and, uh, and test it and, and have a bunch of fun with it. All right. See you guys in that one. I don't know what's coming next week. We'll see. All right. Bye.